Ustedes se conocen los más amigos de años. Este, van a ampliarnos eh, la información muy bien con respecto de la entomología. Te voy a dar muy poco inglés, pero de repente dice: Hola, ¿cómo está? A ver, ¿cómo está? Ah, eso también te ayuda. Hola, amigos. Hola, amigos. Buenos días a todos. Uh, as, uh, as, uh, first, I would like to say thank you, Dr. Alfonso Marisalas, for the invitation to come to this conference. This is a very important conference. Uh, Chicken Media is going to be very important for our region. And again, I want to apologize for my inability to speak Spanish. Uh, like many Americans, uh, I barely speak English very well. So let's see if I got this. Uh... Ah, very good. So what I want to talk about is chicken breeding, first of all, in a very broad sense. I want to talk about the drivers of global change in vector-borne disease, the long-term patterns that we have seen, and the fact that this is nothing really new. We have been doing these things to ourselves for many, many years. Chicken breeding is just the latest in a series of viruses and vectors that we have transported around the world. And what I would like to talk about is, in, in the broad way, these invasive viruses and vectors, focusing on the drivers of change, mostly travel and trade, and then focusing on the systems that we're concerned with, Aedes albopictus, Aedes aegypti, and the viruses that they transmit. And then I'll close with more information on chikungunya in the Americas and some of the preparation work that's been done, and some of the progress in prevention and control. But I want to start with, I know you probably can't read this, I've tried putting it in Spanish down here, it's very, very small, but the, the important parts out of this paper by Robert Southers in about 10 years ago was that he was looking at the drivers of global change that are influencing vector-borne diseases. And in, in, in what he was saying is that we are doing things to our environment uh, that come along with cultural change, come along with progress, come along with prosperity, come along with changes in population growth that are permanently changing things, that are, that are doing things to our world that uh, we don't understand the consequences of it, and that may have long-term permanent consequences in many areas. And he was specifically talking about vector-borne diseases. Uh, and he was, he was concerned that this grand experiment that's being done cannot be reversed, and that we don't understand what's, uh, what we're doing to our environments. And it, not that we can avoid this, but it's something that we should be aware of. He identified eight different areas where he, he said that the changes in the, in the environment were affecting vector borne diseases. He talked about factors that had global origins and global impacts, atmospheric composition, climate change, climate variability, the things that have been the big press lately. But he spent a lot of time talking about things that are of local origin, but are occurring globally. These things are occurring everywhere in different patterns. Land use, agricultural and industrial pollution, human trade and new movements, invasive vectors and pathogens, urbanization, all of these things that we talk about that we know affect vector more diseases. I'm going to focus in on just two of these, trade and human movement, and invasive pathogens and vectors. And how they uh, and how they uh, the the uh, the aids the Egypti, and those other things fall into these patterns. So I'll be talking about the vectors, Egypti and Albopictus, and several of the pathogens that they transmit, and these global the global drivers of change. But first, I want to start off with a story. Now I'm calling it One Traveler's Tale because it, it shows the speed with which things move and the complexity of trying to understand these, these patterns. Now, we know that in December 6th, uh, Pajo announced that there was chicken gunia cases on St. Mark. Local transmission was occurring there. 11 days later, we found out from our system within CDC that in Miami and Dade County, a cruise ship crewman was positive for chicken gunia virus. When we did the investigation, what we found was that this cruise ship with this person on board departed Fort Lauderdale on December 9th. They then arrived on December 11th in Belize. 
the next day arrived in Postal. And then two days later, we're back in Fort Lauderdale. When he arrived in Fort Lauderdale, he went to the hospital with fever, rash, partial arthralgia. And on November 15th, he was diagnosed with chicken breeding virus. Now, we didn't find out about it, as I said, until December 16th, one month later. So the possibilities were that this person was infected in Belize, was infected in Cozumel, could have been infected in Fort Lauderdale or some other source. On further investigation, we found that the person was in the Philippines for two months before coming to Fort Lauderdale and the next day leaving uh, with symptom onset on November 7th and then leaving the next day for this cruise. So what we had was this person was migrating while in Fort Lauderdale, while in Belize, while in Cozumel, and was probably recovered and not migrating by the time they got back. So this was not the introduction, because of the timing and locations, this was not the introduction that resulted in the introduction of the Asian strain of chicken bringing into, into uh, St. Martin. But it shows the type of tra travel patterns, the speed with which this can occur. And we know from some other analyses that a person in, in, uh, uh, in India can be in Merida, Mexico within 30 hours. So the period of time from, from one part of the world where there's an operating going on to another part of the world is very, very fast. That wasn't always the case, but the pattern was the same. Going back 500 years ago to the 1500s and the triangular trade route between, between Europe, Africa, and the New World, uh, we saw movement of goods, movement of people in very big ways. It was just very slow. It took five to 12 weeks for this middle crossing to occur. One of the things that came, many of the things that came with the slave trade, was Aedes aegypti and yellow fever virus. So with the introduction of aegypti and yellow fever from Africa into the new world, it established an enzoic cycle. And currently there are 12 countries in the Americas that have conditions that are conducive to yellow fever transmission. And in the early part of this, this century, we've seen over 1,100 laboratory-confirmed yellow fever cases in the region. So this is, this is uh, again, uh, um, the chicken, current chicken bunya is a, a, an example of a long-term pattern of moving things around with human activities, resulting in permanent changes. This is not going to change. This is going to stay in our environment. Dengue has followed the same pattern. The origin of dengue is unclear. It's not clear whether it's come out of Africa or Asia. But we know that by the late 18th century, dengue-like disease was being reported widespread uh, in Asia and the Americas. By the late 19th and early, early 20th centuries, the virus was widespread in the tropics and subtropics around the globe. And then shortly after World War II, we saw severe dengue, dengue shock syndrome, dengue hemorrhagic fever becoming more common. Since that time, those symptoms have been reported in over 60 countries. And this is a result of the successive reintroduction of different strains of the dengue virus. And if we look at these patterns from, the, from 1970 to 2004, it's very simple. You can see that now all four serotypes of dengue are, are distributed globally and continue to move around the world with, with infected travelers. The mosquitoes uh, are, are the same way. Aedes albopictus, everyone knows the story, that uh, was initially discovered in tires in Port of, Port of Houston, transported from Asia in containers of used tires that were being, being brought to the United States for reuse, for recycling. Now, like most places in the world, we have tires all over the place. Uh, these, are not, uh, these are not atypical. This was a rather phenomenal pile of tires. But uh, the 80s and 80s album, they just quickly found a home in this new habitat. It's characteristic of a very successful invasive species. And from its dis initial distribution in Houston in 1985, within a short period of time, it's been found through much of the, the eastern United States, and recently pockets of the populations in the western states as well. So this, is, this invasive mosquito has found a, a home that's been very successful, and it's spread across much of the, of, the, of, the, of the United States. And in fact, it's one of the more widespread, more successful invasive species globally. Oops, so let's go back. Coming out of Asia, 
into the United States and then spreading through in Central and South America into the, the Australian region and into Africa and Europe. So we've permanently changed the environment by moving this mosquito from one location to another where it successfully survives. Now, Ann mentioned the, the uh, movement of chicken gooby virus, but there's confluence of events where we have, again, changed things permanently, resulting in changes in, in vector borne diseases. We have Aedes albopictus coming from Asia into the United States in tires, spreading throughout the United States, and then ending up from the United States being transported again in tires into Europe, establishing widely. Coincident with that, we've had chicken gooby virus leave East Africa, get into the Indian Ocean Islands, into India, end up with, with a traveler that was identified and tracked into northern Italy, and in 2007 resulting in a local outbreak causing over 200 cases in a, a moderate climate area in northern Italy. And all of this occurred in a span of about 30 years, 20, about 20 years, from the introduction of Aedes and Apophicus into, into the U.S. and to Italy in 1990, and then from 2004 to 2007, chicken gooby making it to Italy in this way. So again, we're doing things to our environment. We're doing these, these massive changes to our, our economies and our, our movement of people, and they're having unintended, unanticipated consequences that we are not able to change, but we need to be able to adapt to. The last one I've got to mention is Zika virus. Up until a few years ago, it was a fairly unknown obscure virus. It was discovered in 1947 in, in uh, a monkey in Uganda. It's transmitted in much the same way as, as yellow fever and dengue and chicken gooby virus. By Aedes aegypti, Aedes africanus, first of all, Leosephus, and Aedes aegyptatus in Africa. Um, there were sporadic cases through 1981 in Africa and Asia, but it was really a mild disease and fairly, fairly discounted. That causes a mild disease that looks like a mild case of dengue. The first large outbreak, though, occurred on Yap Island in the Pacific in 2007. Dr. Powers was one of the investigators there. So this shows the distribution prior to 2007 with human cases, isolated human cases, mosquito samples, positive serology in this region, and then this first fairly large outbreak in Yap in 2007. Since then, infected travelers have taken from this outbreak in Yap in the Pacific. In 2012, we identified a, a, a chicken gooby outbreak in Western, or a Zika outbreak in Western Thailand that looked like a dengue outbreak that was initially identified as dengue. In 2013 to 14, there was an outbreak in this region in French Polynesia, New Caledonia, and the Cook Islands, with over 20,000 cases occurred. And this year, an outbreak was detected on Easter Island, and then a traveler brought the virus into Santiago, Chile. No local transmission, but this is an example again of how we have moved the virus around and infected people with very rapid travel into areas where there are many places that have confident vectors. So we've, we've seen these things happen for 500 years. We've known about them. As, as Dr. Powers indicated, with the information we had about chicken gooder, early on we determined that we needed to do some planning in the Western Hemisphere. So Pan American Health Organizations, CDC, many ministries of health around the region convened on several occasions to determine what we could do. And the components of this chicken gooder planning that we worked with PAHO on consisted of some of the things and and talked about developing diagnostic tests that uh, we could use as a gold standard. Developing reagents until commercial assays could be, could be made available. Uh, doing training in the IgM ELISA, the IgG ELISA, and the RT-PCR, which is a very important test of chicken gooby. We worked with Pavo for training to develop uh, proficiency evaluation for many of the regional reference laboratories. And then we worked on preparedness and response guidelines. And much of the information that Anne pulled in her talk about symptoms and diagnostics comes from this preparedness and response for chicken gooby virus that uh, the Pan American Health Organization developed in collaboration with us and many other region partners, covering a, a very comprehensive set of topics. Uh, this is available in English and Spanish, both on our website and the PAO website. So if you don't have them, uh, I, I recommend that you get it. It's a very good resource. A lot of experts contributed to this. 
and provides information about detection, uh, lab-based surveillance, and response activities. Yes. Also because we, we were aware of the, the situation in the Caribbean region, where there are many small countries with fewer resources, we worked with PAHO to develop a preparedness and response specifically for the Caribbean region. In 2012, trying to craft a network for surveillance and communication and to ensure that there was a way to get samples diagnosed uh, quickly and accurately so that they could track the spread. Unfortunately, uh, 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 the, I guess, fortunate or unfortunate, uh, the virus was first detected in the French territories where there was a very good infrastructure put in place because of their prior experience with the uh, with the reunion and the islands of the Pacific and the, 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 the Indian Ocean. So the, the current situation I gave you an overview, but I want, I want to run through this again so that you can get an appreciation for how quickly this virus has moved through the area. As I said, on December 6th of 2013, we received notice that there were locally transmitted cases on the island of St. Martin in the French Antilles. By the end of December, four more island countries, Martinique, Guadeloupe, St. Bartholomew, and St. Martin, the Dutch side of the island, reported uh, locally transmitted cases. By the end of January, British Virgin Islands, Dominica, and Guadeloupe also reported local transit of cases. So the virus is now moving very quickly through these islands. By the end of February of 2014, we saw the, the virus reported from St. Kitts and Nevis, not a surprise, or very, very closely related to the, to the islands, but we saw the first local transmission in South America in French Guiana. A great concern because this is an area that's also a very high risk of dengue and also, of course, in Brazil and many other highly populated countries. By the end of March, Dominican Republic, one of the largest countries of population in, in the Caribbean, was infected. With about 11 million people, this was a great concern. Um, in April, we saw St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines of Antigua showing positive transmission. And then in May, Haiti, another large country with about 10 million people and a very challenged medical uh, uh, public health system. Uh, Guyana, another country in South America, and then Puerto Rico with about four and a half million people showed first transmission of the virus. So within, a, within about five months, this virus has moved through a large geographic area into areas with large number, large human populations where we're going to see substantial impact on their healthcare systems. Now, June is not over, but so far, we've got uh, El Salvador that's reporting strongly suspect cases, as Dr. Powers indicated, but uh, we have every suspicion that these will come up to be positive, and of course, that's not far from where we're sitting right here today. So we, we now have uh, uh, multiple countries in the region uh, showing, showing evidence of chicken transmission. And we have, from the latest PAHO report, over 170,000 suspect and confirmed cases, 17 countries. Mark, and markedly, I want to point out that the incidence so far has been quite high. It was 11% of the population with clinical disease in St. Martin. And in the Dominican Republic, 77,000 cases reported in just over three months. So the, the virus is moving extremely quickly, and this is the pattern that we've seen in the past and we continue to see in the future. So again, we've permanently changed our environment. We have now brought chicken billion, and in many cases, the uh, Aedes albopictus vectors, the urban cycle, into our environment. But as Anne mentioned, there's also a somatic cycle with non-human primates and, and other mosquitoes that can transmit the virus in Africa. We also have New World non-human primates, and we have New World somatic vectors that we know nothing about. This is a completely uninvestigated area to determine whether we can establish in the American tropics a somatic cycle that will persist and maintain this virus in our area. Uh, this is something that we need to look into fairly quickly, but will not be easy to do. Now, vector control is the only prevention that we currently have available. There are no vaccines that are on the, the, the late-stage clinical trials that will likely be available. So we're stuck with vector control. And this is a picture from 1930. 
we are still using pretty much the same techniques and we're not having much success. So there have been a number of papers published in recent years about why can't we control lean security. And we could have an entire symposium just on challenges with controlling lean security. In fact, we did that in Panama not too many months ago. Uh, so there are many things, insecticide resistance, urbanization, lack of resources, poor surveillance programs, uh, in, 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 inefficient commitment by our governments um, to, to these programs. But what it comes down to is we don't have effective vector control programs that are in place right now that would deal with dengue or chicken food. We do have, fortunately though, several new tools that are based on better technologies, better understanding that are being developed that within a, within a few years, in some cases, uh, will be widely available, I believe. Not only do they reduce the abundance of mosquitoes, but they address some of the other problems that we've experienced in trying to control Aedes aegypti. The need to find and treat all the larval habitats. We have massive cities with millions, tens of millions of people. We can't find all the larval habitats. So we need to find a way to get around that. We need to find ways to reduce vector competence so that we have mosquitoes, but they're not good at transmitting. Or we reduce the survivorship. Maybe they just don't live as long, and if they can't live as long, they can't transmit the virus as efficiently. When we get things like a dengue vaccine, or hopefully someday a chicken gooby vaccine in place, these things will help us in managing those diseases. Some of the things that are, that are in progress now that have quite great, great promise is testing the fungus, taking the cloth, infesting it, and contaminating it with a fungal spore, and letting them, the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes land on that and become infected, and that will then kill them. Uh, using uh, sugar, uh, toxic sugar baits, we know that mosquitoes feed on sugar in order to, in order to, uh, uh, to stop them, in order to kill them. So uh, we're putting toxins in. Uh, we're using better traps for baiting, for, for trapping out mosquitoes. We're using uh, the mosquitoes themselves to disseminate the toxins. This auto-dissemination uh, idea where the mosquito at a resting site picks up the pesticide and then the female mosquito deposits the pesticide in the larval habitat. So we don't have to find the larval habitat for the pesticides. The mosquitoes have the ability to do that. And then enlisting uh, improved knowledge of, of, of uh, mosquito genetics, using uh, insects with dominant lethal genes, sometimes we call sterile male release, but it's really quite different from them. Uh, they can, by changing the genes, produce flightless females. The mosquitoes are produced, but they can't fly. They can produce uh, a lethal gene where they go through the larval stage with die as pupae. Uh, and then also there's great promise shown with Wolbachia. Wolbachia can be used uh, with uh, Wolbachia carrying males in certain strains to produce embryonic death. Um, Wolbachia can also be used to shorten the life of the mosquito. And again, if they live a less period of, life, less period of time, they, uh, they can't uh, develop the, uh, the, the viruses efficiently. And then there are also Wolbachia strains that restrict or, or limit the red virus replication in the mosquito. So there are new technologies that are coming to bear that we will have uh, in, in our, our toolbox of mosquito control influence to use in the near future. So just to summarize, human-produced global changes continue to affect vector-borne diseases and our ability to control them. Many of these changes are irreversible. Uh, we have little chance of stopping changes because they're just associated with human progress and, and human sociological change. So we need to adapt. We need to improve surveillance. We need to improve prevention. We need better vaccines, better treatments, and we need better vector control. So I will stop there. And again, I thank you for the opportunity. I apologize for my inability to speak Spanish. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to the remainder of the conference. Gracias.